Good afternoon. Welcome back to our Friday devotional. I hope you guys have had a great week since we last were together. We've started a series that I call Battle Ready. And uh, we are looking at what it takes to be ready for battle on God's behalf. Last week, we were covering what is battle worthy, what in your life are you willing to go to battle for, or what is, is what I'm living for worth dying for? is a good question. Maybe that's our takeaway. And I've heard it said, God would ask this question, because we may come to this point that we would make a proclamation to God that, God, I am willing to die for you. And then God would ask, are you willing to live for me? And so that was last week's lesson. If you didn't have a chance to uh, join us, you can check it out on firstaztech.org if you would like to do so. And today's lesson is know your enemy. If we are going into battle, we clearly have an enemy. Uh, we will be looking in God's Word in the first book of the Bible in Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 through 7. But in 30 minutes time, our devotionals are short, and we try and shoot for 25 to 30 minutes time. Sometimes we run over. In 30 minutes time, I cannot fully go into every aspect of our enemy and every aspect of what you should be on the look for or how he would even choose to attack us. But what I can do is open up God's Word and hopefully open up the door of your mind so that you would further explore our enemy and how he attacks us, how he's attacked us in the past, and likely would prepare us for how he would choose to attack us in the future. And not only ourselves, but we need to become aware of how our enemy attacks people around us in our circle of influence. Because um, he does, and we'll witness those attacks on our loved ones. And we can stand in the gap, we can intercede for those, on their behalf, through prayer, and there are actions that we can take that could help thwart those attacks from our enemy. I'm going to look at a, just a couple aspects because we are limited on time, and I feel that there are important aspects. Something, a, a point I wanted to bring out was how Satan attacks us. You know, he would prefer to wound us than martyr us. I brought with me an example, a, uh, a tool that I can use to illustrate what I'm talking about. This is a bullet, and particularly what I'm focused on is the projectile, the, the actual bullet. This is what we call an FMJ, a full metal jacket. It means there's a full metal covering over the lead core. And this was adopted in, for militaries across the worlds to use in engagement with other nations in battle. Um, following the Geneva Convention, there was the Hague Conventions in 1899, is when countries around the world decided to adopt this as an acceptable practice. They were mapping out what would be prosecutable crimes or offenses in the act of war, war crimes. And the FMJ came about, the advocation for it was, that this was a more humane way to conduct battle. The bullets of the past, up to this point, would flatten or they would mushroom when entering the human body, causing devastating wounds, which often, most times, led to death. Um, the powers that be, on behalf of humanity, thought it would be better to come up with a practice that would be less impactful on the individual soldier. Soldiers were called into war, into battle on behalf of their country. But men were becoming so wounded that when they went back to their farms, they could no longer provide for their families if they weren't killed on the battlefield. 
So as a humane proposal, we would adopt this bullet type so that we would wound soldiers on the battlefield versus killing everyone. An unintended advantage of adopting this projectile type was the fact that when you wounded a soldier on the battlefield, it overwhelmed the resources of that nation. Let's look at that. A wounded person on the front lines, it's going to take individuals to come treat them where they're at, get them off of that battlefield, remove them from the fight, take them to a hospital, triage center, and start to treat them. And you can see that a dead person requires no others in assistance, but a wounded person will often require two more individuals to care for them. And what that does is it overwhelms the nation's resources and it mires them down on the battlefield. So the use of an FMJ created an unintended advantage on the battlefield. It did save lives um, because it pokes a hole through the individual and oftentimes just creates a wound, thus removing them from the fight in the battlefield. But let's look at wounded on the battlefield. We can see that that's how Satan truly likes to attack us. If he martyrs us, then we can be used as a martyr would be. We, it would glorify God. But sometimes when he wounds us and leaves us there on the battlefield, it mires down the mission of the church. Uh, wounded Christians sitting in our church are not on mission oftentimes. Oftentimes we stifle the spirit when we sit here wounded. And so that is one of the uh, best ways Satan can choose to attack us is not to martyr us, but just to wound us. Sometimes the wounding that takes place on the battlefield comes from friendly fire. Sometimes that happens in our own churches. Sometimes we suffer wounds from friendly fire, unintended attacks. But we need to be careful that in this battle, because I've heard it said, the Christian army is the only army that goes around shooting its wounded. I'd hate for that to be true, but it might be. It may be a knee-jerk reaction that we have to the wounded and not knowing how to minister to their needs, not knowing how to help them heal, how to help them get back on, into the fight on the battlefield. Sometimes we... We run up to that wounded individual and out of panic, we put them out of their misery. <laughs> I might have been guilty of doing that myself. But we want to be aware that that happens so that we can avoid it. I've given you plenty of time, as our pastor would like to say, to find these verses. So if you'd turn with me now, let's... Join me in the reading of God's Word. Now the serpent was more crafty than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Indeed, has God said, You shall not eat from any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, From the fruit of the trees of the garden we may eat. But from the fruit of the tree which is in the middle of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat from it, or touch it, lest you would die. And the serpent said to the woman, You surely shall not die. For God knows that in the day you eat from it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was desirable to make one wise, she took from its fruit and ate, and she gave it also to her husband with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked, 
and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loin coverings. This is when our enemy first enters the scene in humanity, in our word. But there's a couple points I want to point out in how the enemy attacked us. And who was his partner in that? Clearly says, now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field. So he came in and initiated sin with a question. He didn't enter the garden and seek out Eve and destroy her and kill her. He didn't martyr her, steal her away from Adam destroying God's creation. It's not how he chose to attack. He asked a simple question and then sat back and watched it unfold. I think too often times we give the devil more due than he's more than he's due. We fear, we place too much fear on Satan's behalf. We should fear the consequences of our sin. We should fear the wrath of God. Satan doesn't get to do anything that God does not allow. We can look in the book of Job and discover that for ourselves. But we don't have time to go there today. But we know that Satan is not omniscient either. But he went into humanity and launched the first and best attack he could that reverberated throughout history, throughout mankind, and led to each one of our own iniquity. What a clever beast he was to enter the garden and ask a simple question. Satan doesn't want us to fear him. It's not his goal. He doesn't want us to be afraid of him. He wants us to accept him. He wants us to be his friend. He wants influence in our lives. And if we only fear him, we'll distance ourselves from him. Sometimes that's what we do to God. Instead of having a healthy fear of God, we have an unhealthy fear of God, and we put distance in between us and God. So we think he's unfair. Think he's not as just as he claims to be. We look at examples in our Bible, and we argue with God's judgment. We argue with how he chooses to respond to our sin. Satan doesn't. He delights in our sin. He's a lot like that child you went to school with. We, we each can remember one. It was in the classroom, often called Johnny. Sorry to my friends that are named Johnny, but I'm going to use your name for this example. Johnny sits in the class and he's obstinate to the school teacher. He makes it a struggle for the students around him to study and take part in the lesson. He's always cutting up and making jokes and constantly in trouble. It seems to be his purpose in life. But Johnny's true delight, if you'll remember, is when he got you in trouble. When he gets you to try some of the things he's getting away with. Or convinces you that not every rule is meant to go unbroken. And as soon as you write that note or step out of line of the teacher's standards, Johnny's the first one raising his hand. Oh, teacher, teacher, look what Susie did. Yeah, she's failing. That's where Satan's true delight is, in getting us to create our own demise. Let's look at what Eve did. She looked and noticed with her own eyes that the the fruit would be desirable. She made her own choice to join 
Satan in that sin. In that moment, she became her own worst enemy. And I'm not beating up on Eve. If it would have been Will in the garden, well, Will would have probably cut the tree of life down and built a little shack of it and piled up all the fruit and started eating it. And when God came back into the garden, Will would have said, Hey, God, look what I did. Yeah, that would have been the story we'd be looking at today. It would have been different, but at the same, in the same, I would have failed. Every one of us would have. And so we don't need to beat up on Eve. We need to learn from Eve. We need to learn from her and Adam's mistakes, because Adam, he on his own chose to eat of the fruit too. He didn't say, whoa, Eve, wait a minute. God told us not to do that. He witnessed her doing it. As we oftentimes witness the world getting away with sin, seemingly no consequences in their life for it, and we want to walk down that path too. We want to join them in that sin, and we may not suffer any immediate consequences. We, not, we may not see the consequences in this flesh. They're eternal. Our consequences are eternal. And Satan would like you to believe just like he did Eve. Oh, you surely will not die. Yeah, you may not die in the flesh, but that eternal death is far more devastating. Far more devastating. If you had not secured your eternity before you died in the flesh, you were in certain peril. But we can look at this example and see that Satan really just opened the door for us to fail. So if you really want to look at one of your number one enemies, I think we could take a look in the mirror. I know I've caused more heartache and trouble in my life without Satan's help at all. In fact, I think he got to sit back and laugh and and go, wow, Will, good job. I wouldn't have even thought of that. I can't believe how creative you are with your sin. We are often our own worst enemy. I taught Hunter's Ed for a few years, and one of the facts that really stuck out to me while teaching Hunter's Ed was the fact that related to firearm accidents, incidences with a misfire and a firearm, our worst enemy was ourself. I can safely say that over 50% of the accidents, accidents that take place today are self-inflicted. When I was teaching, the, the statistic was pretty high, but I know year to year we whittle that statistic down by creating habits of safety. It's our goal to teach the, the individuals that will possess and take a firearm into the field how to be safe with it. How to not be your own worst enemy. Because we knew through statistics that that was the fact. Um, you were more likely to wound yourself or one of your friends than the opposite. So, if you handle the firearm long enough, you would eventually have a misfire. So what we wanted to train those individuals in was a habit of safety. And the number one habit of safety that I could pass on to a young person concerning the handling of a firearm was muzzle control. Never point that firearm anywhere that you do not intend that bullet to go. Never point it at an unintended target. Because when you release that projectile, there's no calling it back. So we would teach them to know their target and beyond, but to maintain at all times muzzle control. They were the number one safety on that firearm. But you know, sometimes 
we don't exercise muzzle control in our world. Oftentimes, and it's unfortunate, we won't exercise muzzle control in our church. And what am I talking about? We'll muzzle, muzzle our mouth, our words, muzzle control. It's funny how the, the two kind of relate to each other. Because we know Scripture tells us that our words can breed life or death. Our words can wound our fellow Christians. Can wound them so badly, it cripples them. It stifles the mission they're supposed to be on. It slows their spiritual growth. And it certainly stifles the Spirit, the moving of the Holy Spirit in your congregation, in our church. But we are guilty of that. Sometimes we don't practice muzzle control. Maybe we're not aware that our words hurt people. Maybe we're not aware that we could say things that cause that to happen. Or maybe we are and we're okay with it. God's not. We need to ask ourselves, are we our worst enemy? Or sometimes are we being the enemy of fellow Christians? Sometimes we do that to each other. But no one is perfect. No one's perfect. And if you're holding your fellow Christians, your pastor or somebody else, anybody in this world, up to a level of perfection, you have to ask yourself, how perfect are you? Are you perfect enough to hold people up to that standard of perfection? That they should always treat you kindly. They should always have kind words directed in your way. Well, we're not perfect people. And forgive me if I've hurt you with my words before, unintended or intentional. I could be guilty of both. And so can you. We have to be honest with ourselves. Are we being an agent for Satan? Do we allow him to use us? Much like Eve in the garden when she took the fruit and offered it to her husband, she had become the partner of the serpent in that moment. And we do that. We do that as humans As Christians, sometimes we aid Satan in his attacks. We say hurtful words or we do hurtful things or act in a certain way. And at the same time of holding people up to that standard of perfection, we need to be aware that it's not healthy to walk around with our heart on our sleeve inviting people to punch it. Sometimes we sit in church showing off that attack of the enemy. Do you see this arrow? Look how the enemy attacked me. No wonder I can't serve God like I should. Look at how I'm attacked. But it's up to us to deny Satan those attacks. We can pull out that arrow and we can say, Not today, Satan. Not today. Sometimes we don't even know that arrow's in us. We've been attacked and we're walking around wounded and something hurts and I'm not sure what it is, but if you're a buddy Christian, you're going to walk up to your fellow Christian and say, hey, dude, you you got an arrow sticking out of your back. And we don't want to grab onto that arrow and say, can you feel it? I mean, you're wounded. Look how wounded you are. Or sometimes we see that wounded Christian and we identify them as the enemy. They've done something so wrong that they're under attack. Or if they're under attack, we don't want to you know, get in the line of fire. We distance ourselves from our fellow wounded Christians. And maybe that's how, come the, how the statement came about. We're the only army that shoots its wounded. And sometimes we do that. Or we could choose to go over and pull that arrow out of our fellow Christian 
Help them identify where the attack came from. And put some salve on the wound. I'm not saying that these arrows, these attacks aren't real. Man, sometimes you pull that arrow out and it's a real wound. There's blood gushing out of the hole. You need some first aid. But it is our choice in how we react. We often don't get to choose everything in life. We didn't get to choose our parents. You didn't get to choose whether you had a dad abandon you in life. You didn't get to choose whether a spouse cheated on you, whether loved ones hurt you in ways that are hard to reconcile. A lot in life you didn't get to choose. You didn't get to choose diseases that were wrought on you. You didn't get to choose how fast your hair falls out. But God lets us choose the most important things in this life. He lets us choose how we respond to Satan's attacks. We have that choice. We can sit there wounded, wanting to die, or we can pick ourselves up out of the dust. And sometimes it's our job to help pick up others that have been wounded, help pick them up out of the dust, help set them back on that path to righteousness. And we get to choose where we spend eternity. God allows us to choose that. We don't get to choose everything in this life, but He allows us to make the most important choices we have to make. And that's where we're going to spend eternity. You know, in those verses we just read, we can look at that and we can identify that is when the first pandemic against mankind was launched. Sin launched against us was the first pandemic. Sin, that disease that kills each one of us and damns us to an eternal separation from our God. Sin truly was the first and still is a pandemic running rampant through mankind. It's claimed more souls than any other thing. But God provided the vaccine. Jesus Christ is the perfect vaccine for that pandemic. The number one pandemic killing humans today. Jesus is available and free. You can accept that vaccine. You can ask God for forgiveness. You can ask Jesus to be the boss of your life. You can accept that forgiveness, that atonement for our sins that Jesus paid on the cross, a price that we could not pay, a gift we do not deserve, but it's freely available to us. And all we have to do is accept it. I hope that if you do not know Jesus Christ, if you've not been covered by His saving blood to avoid the pandemic of sin, I'd hope you would choose to do that today. Come to know Christ. Would you please pray with me? God, thank You for Your Word. God, thank You for providing salvation for us, something we could not attain on our own. God, thank you for the choices you do allow us to make. Thank you for our, your love for us. Help us to, not just to live in this world, Lord, but to make it a better place for your honor and for your glory. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Thank you.